Hello and welcome to this event, which is called Curious Connections, the Social Life of Egg and Sperm Donation. My name is Jennifer Mason. I'm from the Morgan Centre at the University of Manchester and I'm going to be chairing the event. And session one is called Being an Egg or Sperm Donor, Key Findings from the Curious Connections Project. Um, and this session provides insights and key findings from the ESRC funded Curious Connections Project um, that's been been uh, conducted in the Morgan Centre and the Department of Sociology at the University of Manchester between 2017 and, two, and 2020. Um, and I'm going to introduce to you Petra Nordquist, who's the, the project lead from the, from the and she's waving now, um, from the Curious Connections Project, and uh, Leah Gilman, who's the project researcher. Um, and she's also waving. Um, and they are going to outline the aim of the project, talk about its research methods, um, and who took part, and then they'll discuss the key discoveries they've made about donors' lives and relationships. They're going to speak for about 40 minutes, I think, um, and then we should have around 30 minutes for, for a Q&A. So um, at that point, I'd like to hand over, please, to Petra, who's going to begin. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Right, well, uh, thank you everyone for attending. I'm so delighted to have you here. And although I am absolutely gutted that I can't actually be in the same room as you now, um, it's delightful that bringing this event online has made uh, it possible for lots of other people to join us. So we have quite a lot of people from abroad here today um, and people um, people from all over the place so that is really fantastic uh, in terms of you know seeing a positive in bringing this event online so in terms of the structure I'm going to introduce the project and what the project is about and the ideas behind it uh, Leah will cover what we did how we did the research and then we have a huge amount of data between us so what we're going to do is to give you a flavor of the kinds of findings that we've made uh, over the course of the project and we will then uh, we will we are writing these uh, findings as well as other findings up in a book that will be published with emerald next year we hope um, so do keep an eye out and and uh, bear in mind as well that these are these are sort of uh, these are work in progress findings so because of the pandemic we are a bit delayed uh, many in the team have children who have been at home for months on end uh, so uh, your, well, your questions are really welcome. Uh, we're still sort of fine tuning our analysis and so on. So it'd be really interesting to hear, to hear your ideas and your notes on this. Um, also, before I, before I sort of move on and actually introducing the project in more detail, I want to say that the team and I have decided that we wanted to dedicate this event to our dear colleague David Morgan, who very sadly passed away a couple of weeks back in June. Uh, David was the most generous and fantastic colleague and even though he was retired uh, he kept on coming to meetings and was such an, an a live part of the Morgan Centre and David was indeed the Morgan of the Morgan Centre so we are very sad at this loss and sad at David not being here with us today which I'm sure he would have been uh, so uh, this is this is for David in some ways so uh, what is then the Curious Connections Project? Well, it's a, it's a sociological research project based in a sociology department, looking at uh, how, what it means to be an egg donor in terms of donors' own lives and donors' own relationships. So it explores this from the, from the point of view of donors themselves, but the project has gone beyond donors to look at also what it means for donors' partners, donors' parents, donors' sisters in some places, um, as well as infertility counsellors. Um, as Jennifer said, it's funded by the Economic and Social Research Council and it started in January 2017. We've had a, a few children has been born since then, which is why it's, it's still with us and we're still working on it. Uh, so why then should we study egg and sperm donors? Well, according to the official statistics in the UK provided by the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority, just under 58,000 children has, have been born since record began in 1992 and until 2016, which is the most recent data that we have. So for those of you who know quite a lot about donor conception, you will know that there's obviously a, a huge sort of 
or we, we don't know, but that is likely to be quite a conservative estimate because there's also obviously children born before records began. There are people who go abroad for donor conception who are not counted in this. There are people who use friends or online uh, communities to find their donors and they are also not counted in these numbers. So, so that the, the number of babies are likely to be higher than this. Uh, obviously donors are, are really central to these practices and yet relatively little is known about them. Uh, and particularly what we bring with, with our project is to look then at how being a donor impacts on donors' own lives and their relationships uh, and how this compares for different kinds of donors. So we've been talking to both egg and sperm donors, we've been talking to identity release donors as well as known donors, uh, we've been talking to egg share donors, so there's a huge complexity actually amongst the donors who are included in the project. Um, why is it then important to understand something more about donors in relation, not, not just donors as sort of free floating islands, if you like, but also in relation to their relationships? Well, I was part of a study a few years back called Relative Strangers, where I, together with Carol Smart, was looking at um, how participants of donor conception uh, disclose and think about their donor conception in relation to, not, ju not just to themselves as parents, but also in relation to grandparents and wider kin. And we found that donor conception could really ripple through family relationships and sort of um, reverberate, if you like, sometimes causing secrets and some causing sensitivities and tensions uh, in whole family networks and, and sort of changing ways of relating. So uh, when I started thinking about donors, I was also thinking, well, if, if receiving donor eggs into the family can cause these kind of ripples through the family networks, then what is it like to give away donor sperm? And how do donors navigate these uh, you know, having, having given away donor sperm. Uh, so why is it then studied? Uh, why is it important that we study this now? Well, donor conception is at a really interesting point, historically speaking, because it had changed so dramatically over the recent years. So whereas it used to be sort of something that was kept secret, donors were encouraged to go home and forget about donating and parents were, all, that was also the case for parents. Uh, we had donor anonymity for a very long time in the UK. And then in, in the sort of early 2000s, things started to change and donor identity release, meaning that donors were no longer completely anonymous in UK clinics, but rather uh, donor conceived children could trace their identity when they turn 18. That became, that came into law in 2005. So on the horizon now in 2023, the first of these young people will turn 18 and will be able to realise their right of, of tracing the identity of the donors. So for donors, that has meant that the possibility of keeping it secret when going home and forgetting about it is no longer uh, sort of as possible as it used to be, perhaps, which means that they also need to deliberate on whether they're going to tell people they're a donor and if so, how. And, and just because that is sort of need that they maybe now need to do, it doesn't mean it's necessarily a straightforward task to do so. And there is, there is some evidence to suggest that family members may not necessarily receive these news um, very happily. Uh, and we'll, we'll come on to talking a little bit about that later on. Uh, but our approach, just before I hand over to Leah, is just to say that our sociological approach, as I said, is to start with the donor, but then look beyond the donor and, and look at the relationships in which the donor is embedded. And so in that sense, we come from a relational perspective in sociology, which, which says that in order to understand an individual's life, we need to look beyond that individual and look at the lives that lives in parallel to it, that impedes it, and that it impedes as well. So it's our, our focus is a relational focus. Also, our focus is a qualitative focus, which means that rather than asking people to fill in questionnaires, we ask people in, to take part in interviews where we talk about their experiences. And by doing so, we understand something about processes that questioners can't really provide. So with these words, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to hand over to Leah, who's going to talk about what we did. So let's hope this works relatively well. Right. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me OK? Yeah, that's great. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about our research methods and then go on to talk about some key findings from the study. 
So in terms of our research methods, as Petra said, this is qualitative study. So one of the big things that we did was we went out and we talked to people. Uh, we conducted in-depth interviews uh, with donors and with donors' relatives. Um, and we also spoke to infertility counsellors who work with donors. Um, in addition to that, um, we analysed um, legal and policy documents which regulate donor conception. And we thought especially about what they meant for donors donating in, in this age of openness and traceability. Um, and then in terms of the actual data set that we looked at, this picture is, a, is representative of our, of our final sample, our final data. Um, and as you can see, a big part of it is um, the interviews that we conducted with donors. So we conducted 52 interviews with donors to split there. So half were sperm donors. And then we spoke to 25 egg donors and also one um, embryo donor who was a single woman. Um, and in addition to that, we spoke to 21 relatives of donors, 18 counsellors or donor coordinators, and we analysed 61 um, policy documents as well. Um, now, as many of you will already know, there are all these different pathways and routes that people can take into to being an egg or sperm donor. And this graph is really just an attempt to kind of map that really um, to think about the types of donation that the donors we interviewed had experienced. Now I want to emphasize that they don't necessarily map onto individual donors. So one donor might have experienced multiple types of donation. And I'm not going to go into the exact numbers here just because of time and people can look back at this if they want to. But, but I just really want to point out the mix of different um, kinds of donation the people we'd interviewed had experienced. So we spoke to people who were, who were egg sharers, for example, which means that they um, were having their own IVF treatment and they had decided to donate half their eggs in exchange for reduced cost treatment themselves. Uh, we, donated, we spoke to people who donated to somebody that they knew in some capacity um, and we donated, um, we, um, we spoke um, to um, what the clinics often call altruistic donors as well, which basically means people who were donating to someone they didn't know um, and who also weren't participating, weren't having their own treatment, so they weren't egg sharers or, or sperm sharers, it's, it's sometimes available. It's also worth saying that amongst the men we interviewed, there were some sperm donors um, who donate, donated completely outside of clinics as well, so obviously egg donors would need to go to a, a clinic for the medical procedure, but some of the sperm donors had, had sort of not gone through the clinic route. Um, and amongst the known donors we interviewed, that was a really diverse group as well, because we'd met, we'd interviewed people who had donated to someone in their personal network, perhaps a friend or family member, or more distance than that. Um, but we also spoke to donors who'd, who'd met a recipient or looked for a recipient on um, one of the matching websites that are out there or via Facebook groups or other kind of online groups, um, as well as a small number of egg donors who'd become known egg donors um, through a surrogacy agency and found a recipient that way. Um, um, one of the big things that sort of brings them, most of the donors together is that nearly all had donated since the change in the law that Petra mentioned. So they'd all donate more, most of them had donated since 2005 uh, when, it, when donors had to consent to become traceable. Um, but we did include a few who had donated earlier than that for various theoretical reasons. Um, and in terms of the sample, it's, it's quite diverse in terms of age, in terms of socioeconomic background of the donors and in terms of sexual orientation. Uh, but it's not very diverse, um, our sample, in terms of ethnicity. It's quite white. Um, nearly all of the donors that we interviewed were identified as being white, whether it's white British, white European, white other. Um, and just two of the sperm donors uh, didn't identify as being white, so one black British sperm donor and one Asian sperm donor. Uh, and just briefly before we move on to the findings, this just this graph shows the donor relatives that we interviewed. So there's a there's a mix there in terms of we spoke to parents, to partners of donors, and also some people who were siblings of donors as well. Um, and I have to say we did find certain groups easier to recruit than others, so we found it harder to speak to relatives of sperm donors, generally speaking, and uh, partners 
were more easy to speak to than parents. Um, so as Petra said, rather than trying to say everything that we found out in one talk, which I think would be impossible, uh, what we've done is we picked up on three key findings from the study. Um, so the first thing that I want to talk about is the, is, is the particular moral pressures that seem to be experienced by people who donate in the context of, of this ethic of openness and in, to, in the context of traceability. Uh, on the one hand, there's ex this expectation that they should be available so people can see from the donation. On the other hand, there's also an expectation that they that they take a sort of step back from recipient families, that they that they show they know their place as non-parents. And what we found is that there could be a kind of tension between these two moral imperatives. So first being available, um, what we found is that nearly all the donors we spoke to talked about this moral commitment to being available for contact with people born from the donation if those people wanted it. Um, and I guess in a way it's not surprising because we'd mostly spoken to people who donated since 2005 when, when the law changed around donor anonymity. But I think it's interesting to note that first of all it was more than that they were just agreeing or going along with this. It was really backed up often by a strong sense of this being the right th uh, thing to do, this being a moral obligation. And, and secondly, it was a feeling that was generally shared by those donors who, who, who'd gone out of clinics. Um, so we can probably then assume that people weren't then going out of the clinics in this case, in, our, in, in the case of people we interviewed, to kind of avoid that rule in some way. So like Enric that's quoted here, um, lots of donors specifically reference this idea that children have a right to know where they've come from. Um, and as we know, this is, a, this is a phrase that's been quite prominent in the in the in the drive for greater openness and donor conception. Um, but we also found that donors also talked about this commitment to being available in relation to kind of broader moral co commitments as adults who ought to take responsibility for the consequences of their actions. And they also drew on discourses around children's rights and children's voice and the importance of enabling young people to make choices about their lives. So one egg share donor said um, to me, she said, if, if this might have been Petra actually that she's talking to, but if you play a part in bringing someone into the world, this is me, me putting half towards the creation of another human being, uh, which means that I'm responsible in a way for that person if they ever wanted me to be. However, um, alongside this commitment to, knowing, uh, to being available was another strong moral commitment to knowing their place and knowing their place as non-parents and the importance of signalling this understanding, to signal, signal their understanding to, especially to recipient parents. Um, and this was often discussed um, in relation to ideas about kind of proper gift giving. So for it to really be a gift, you, you have to be prepared to let that go and let people do as they wish with the gift that you've given. Um, and they also talked about it in relation to enabling recipients to experience parenthood fully and properly um, to make sure that recipients felt like to, to make sure they didn't get in the way of that feeling of being a parent in any way and to not make them feel like they had to share that sense of being a parent in, in any way because that would have undermined being a parent uh, which is the whole point as they put it as of wanting to be a donor so Beth says that's the whole point of being an egg donor. She wants someone to go off and have all the fun of being a parent. It's no fun being a parent if someone's poking their nose in all the time. So in order not to be seen as treading on the toes of parents, this meant avoiding any appearance of being kind of too attached to the child born from the donation or, or appearing to take sort of too much responsibility for them in a way which could be viewed as kind of too close to being parental. So we can see then there's a sort of potential tension here between those two moral pressures because they seem to pull donors in kind of different directions in relation to recipient families. Um, on the one hand, you've got to make it clear you're available and you're open for some kind of connection. But on the other hand, you need to make it clear that you know that it's your place to step back and let recipient parents get on with being parents. Um, and I use the word tension, but I do want to stress that Often this is not a huge stress for donors. It's not necessarily this hugely problematic thing that they're, they're wrestling with all the time. But it's something that balancing is something that characterises donating um, in the contemporary UK context, we found. 
and which balance and which donors are uh, in the everyday sense kind of balancing and negotiating um, so to give one example of a kind of more everyday example of how this is kind of balanced um, I want to talk about Ian so he had been telling me about how he'd been collecting family old family photographs and the kind of doing his family history and he'd noticed this what he saw as a really strong resemblance between one of his one of the children can see from his donation and his great aunt possibly a great great aunt and he'd stored up these photos um he was fascinated by this resemblance and he'd stored these up um with a view to thinking that maybe one day someone will get in contact with him um and they might want to see them and he was preparing himself to make these available for them and to fulfill that sense of obligation to them. But he was also very clear when I asked that absolutely he wouldn't mention this to, um, to, the, to the recipient parents. He was in contact with a known donor. So he'd said, um, the gay girls having a family is a really sacred thing for them. It's a really important part of their identity. I'm not going in there and taking any part of that away from them because actually if I was going to go and do that that's sort of undermining a bit it psychologically isn't it um so we kind of manage that by just thinking well I'll just I'll just not mention in that situation it's not appropriate um but then a case where the tension is a bit more explicit maybe more pronounced was it was Abby's when where in this case there had been a breakdown of the relationship with her known recipients um, so there's, there was a, a recipient couple in particular who she realised were, were trying to kind of distance themselves from her um, and she felt like it was her place to respect that and she, she, she had to respect their views in that case. But she also felt a bit torn because she'd already developed a relationship um, with their daughter, with the recipient's daughter, that with the child conceived from her egg donation and and as had her had her own daughter and she felt responsibility almost to not just suddenly disappear for seemingly no reason um and so she made the decision that she would keep sending christmas and birthday presents as she had been but kind of recognizing and making it clear that she realized that the parents might not want to pass them on and that's fine um so in this case it was a bit more of a sort of tangible dilemma a bit more kind of sense of it being really kind of weighed up and not knowing quite what to do and re resolving on this being the answer whereas with Ian it was a bit more instinctive you don't just don't bring it off if it's going to be something that's going to upset people um so this and then the second finding then I want to move on to is um is I want to highlight what we found was um a really strong emphasis across a lot of the interviews um with the donors we spoke to on being neutral and passive and responsive um, in their interactions with donor conceived people and what I want to suggest is that they this was a kind of strategy to manage the moral tensions that I've just set out so it's quite interesting really given the range of ways people go into donation that this is one of the few things that nearly everyone agreed on um, that yes, um, it was important to be available to donor conceived pe uh, people, but the character of this connection, you know, what it might become, if anything at all, is very much left up to the donor conceived person, or if it was a known donation, maybe in conjunction with their parents to figure that out. Um, so these kind of statements were just really typical across all the interviews. So people would say, look, whatever it is, it's all on their terms. I want them to be the creators of the parameters of the parameters of our relationship. Um, I'm being very much led by them. It's got to be down to them. Um, and the opposite was also true. So donors were often very disapproving of the idea that they would be leading this relationship in any way or to have any kind of agenda or expectations about what it might be. And they might use words like controlling or imposing to talk about that even just having a, a view about how you wanted it to go. So I'm going to give three kind of tangible examples of how this came through in the data. So first thing is that when we asked identity release donors, you know, how they felt about the possibility of being contacted in the future, we found that um, often they were very reluctant to really offer an opinion either way. Um, so Becky saying, I'm not, um, I'm not saying it would be better if they got in touch or it would be better if they didn't. I think it would be better if they did, if they were able to do what was right for them. Um, 
And donors were also aware that if someone did get in touch with them, maybe it would be a letter, maybe it would be an email, um, it could be a one-off, just one-off meeting for a coffee, or it could be an ongoing kind of relationship. Um, and they really often emphasise that really any of those is fine, and it's really up to them um, how, this, how this goes. Um, as one of the sperm donors we interviewed, Vincent said this, you know, it's not my gift to decide that. Um, and with the known donors, they were obviously in a slightly different um, situation, um, but it kind of expressed itself in a different way. So in this case, it tended to be about, in terms of communications with recipient families, um, being responsive and not initiating communication. Um, and also about not always waiting to be invited rather than suggesting that you might meet up. So as Gavin says, like, I wouldn't say, oh, when can we come and visit? When can we come and visit? Um, and another thing that was interesting was that when we asked donors, OK, so, you know, you don't know if it'll happen and, you know, there's so many possibilities here. But what do you think would you actually do if you, if you did meet up with somebody in the future or if it's a known donation, you know, when they get older, what, what do you think you might actually do together, um, if anything? And um, one of the things that repeatedly came up was, well, I guess they'll have a lot of questions and I'll just be answering their questions. That would be the thing that came up. It was all, nearly always the first answer and it, and it very often came up. Um, so, yeah, it was quite interesting because donors spent quite a lot of time. They're quite diligent. So they spend a lot of time thinking and anticipating or oh, what kind of questions might they have. And they often try to put the answers to these questions down in the pen portrait if they were clinic donors. Um, and they like Ian and there were other people who'd spent a bit of time like thinking about their family history or gathering a few resources that they might be interested in but I think what's interesting here for us is that how one way it was so it's not to say that donors didn't have interest or curiosity about the people born from the donation but the questions are always imagined being two donors very much one way and donors tend frame their own interest as a bit more trivial or oh, it's just like a scientific interest kind of thing. So I suggest that we could understand these statements and these actions as, as a response to the particular moral pressures on, on donors. So by trying to be neutral and passive, they're, they're able to sort of fulfil their obligations to both be available and also to know their place. Um, and I think about this as an attempt to assign relational authority to others. Um, that is an attempt to kind of let others decide whether and how this connection might develop, what character it might take on. However, there are, there are examples in our research which suggest this was all much easier to say than it was to actually do. So I'm going to talk about these examples first and then come on to why actually I think this. Um, this narrative, this ideology of being neutral and being passive was actually really quite difficult to do in practice. Um, so first of all, uh, Eliza and James, um, these are obviously all pseudonyms that you've probably realised. Um, um, these are two examples where their attempts to appear passive and neutral actually ended up appearing kind of odd or strange for the situation that they were in or unusual. And they're quite different stories, but I think they illustrate the same point. So um, Eliza had donated eggs to a really close friend of hers and a whole interview. It was a really like amazing story. It's a really lovely story. Um, there was a big emphasis in her interview about this being actually so very normal and like this, this relationship of anything was closer. They were still very good friends. The donation was not an issue at all. They saw lots of each other. Their children played together. But she did say, you know, if there is one thing that's different or that's changed about our relationship is that I wouldn't offer her any advice about the kids. Um, and she said, actually, maybe that that's probably something that is different because um, she, you know, the Eliza's kids were that little bit older. And also the, the friends, children, she'd had twins and they were quite challenging as toddlers sometimes are. And she thought, you know what, maybe normally I might have just said something, but I just feel like it's not my place if anything. Um, so in that case, it's a fairly small side note to a, a, a broader it being a non-issue type situation. Uh, but then the other example I want to mention is James. So in his case, he donated sperm to his brother and, and his wife so they could have a child 
um, and, it, and it was all successful and they'd had, um, they'd, they'd had a son who was his nephew. Um, but again, he really emphasized this idea of like, I just don't want to get in the way. I don't want to, um, I want to just be really hands off and not make anything awkward for my brother who was really close to and loved deeply. Um, but then he sort of reflected on this a couple of years later when we were doing the interview and by this point he'd had his own daughter. Um, and he said, you know what, I didn't even, I didn't visit when my nephew was born. Um, and actually when I did visit, I don't think I even held the baby. And so he kind of reflected on it later and you could see how his attempt to kind of just stand back and know his place actually ended up with him behaving in a way which on reflection he realised was maybe a bit strange for an uncle of a, with this, in this close family. And in this case, he, he had, there was quite a bit of a tinge to sadness, of sadness to the whole interview because he felt that he had lost some of that closeness with his brother and he wondered whether the whole, this whole situation had anything to do with it. So I've mentioned these two stories because I think they make visible the fact that in our attempts to kind of appear passive and just go along with what other people want and not have our own view or not try and lead that relationship, these are actually still forms of interaction which do shape the relationship and and it's visible here because these are known donations in cases where we might have expectations about relationships with nephews or close friends and it breaks some of the norms there so you notice it more but i think it's a point that can be true across all kinds of in all kinds of situations when we try and be neutral or passive it's going to impact that relationship Um, and another reason why I think this impression of being neutral is not so easy to actually do in practice was that donor's commitment to being entirely responsive <laughs> inevitably ended up involving other people as well. So, for example, donors had to manage their parents and their siblings in various ways to avoid upsetting their display of kind of knowing their place. Sometimes this just meant not telling them. Um, sometimes this meant, right, correcting their language saying you know no no you're not a grandparent it's not like that um or it could be a bit more actually some don't even touch i know i have to hold them back because they want to be a bit too involved here on the whole this wasn't seen as a major ethical dilemma but it, when it came to thinking about their own children it sometimes got a bit more complicated for donors um so for example uh, becky was um a solo is a solo mom and she had um she was egg sharing in order to initially in order to freeze her own eggs but then sort of through the process decide you know what i'm just going to go ahead and use a sperm donor and i'm going to have the baby now and when we did the interview she had a young baby and she was very committed to this idea of being available to the donor conceived person who might be born from her eggs um very much committed to it being up to them whether they contacted and how this goes and she she was committed to that but what she said was, I made this decision when it was just, just me. And I think it's right that I've got no um, agency in this, if you see, see what I mean. It's, that it's right that I don't have a say. But now that I've got my daughter, it feels harder because I've made these decisions on her behalf to some extent. And she might really want to know this person who's conceived from my eggs. She might really not want to know them. But I've made this commitment to kind of go along with what this other person who we've never met, may never met, has wanted. And that she didn't drop that commitment but you could see it was harder for her now that she was thinking about it from a perspective as a mother um and there were others like becky who found that commitment to following others leave more difficult when they thought about when it realized it impacted on their children and how they could interact with their own children and it could conflict with that other moral imperative that we have um in 21st century to to put our children's needs first um, so I just want to finish off by thinking about what this all tells us um, so I want to suggest that these these narratives and practices of neutrality and passivity offer seem to offer a solution of a kind to this moral balancing act required of contemporary donors to sort of be available and also know their place However, it's much easier to say than do in practice, and it can only really be partial for various reasons. Um, and one of those is, and I'm paraphrasing Susie Scott here, is that doing nothing is a social act and it has social effects, whether we intend them or not. 
Um, if we try and only be responsive and not active or leading in our interactions, then sometimes that's a, that can be seen as a kind of odd way to behave or it certainly has an effect. And feminist methodologists have actually long made this point when it comes to, to research interviews and try not to like lead lead um, participants and ask unleading questions but I think it holds true here as well that, uh, that that's the case and the second thing I just want to finish by drawing attention to how how socially complex it is to give the impression of neutral in a relationship um, and one of the reasons that is so complicated complex is because of our embeddedness in all these other relationships that are going on so giving the impression of being passive in a relationship to one person of which might actually require you to assert authority about how others relate to them or how others relate to you. Um, so you can quickly see how it can't, it's maybe not as easy as it, as it maybe sounded what, from those initial um, quotes that are saying, oh, well, we'll just play it by ear and that'll be, that'll be fine, we'll just play it by ear. Um, okay, and that's, I'm gonna finish there and hand over to Petra for, our, our third our third finding but thank you for listening stop sharing okay so let me get this up Right, thank you, Leah. Uh, so I'm going to try and whisk through uh, the last 10 minutes um, talking about how, who donors tell, why they tell other people, and their patterns of disclosure, if you like. And the theme really for this presentation is about, or this part of the presentation, is about whose story is this? You know, who, as I said in the beginning in my little introduction, donors do come with connections of their own. They're someone's partner, they're someone's child, they're also someone's parent often. Uh, and that in itself raises questions about, do they need to tell that they're a donor, that they've donated? If so, who needs to know? Um, why do they need to know? When do they need to know? Do they need to know at the stage uh, before the donation goes ahead? Or is it okay to tell them years down the line? Um, do they have a right to have a say? Do they have a right to interfere and to sort of say, I don't want you to do this, if, if that's how they feel? Um, disclosure is something that has been at the heart of donor conception debates for some time now. We're very much focusing on the children's right to know and parents' patterns of disclosure, particularly to their children, so recipient parents. Excuse me. <clears throat> but very little is known to date about donors' patterns of disclosure and particularly how that sits uh, in relation to their own families. Uh, so what I'm really trying to get at here is about who is seen to have a stake in the donation, who is seen to be affected by it other than just the donor. And, and by that asking questions about, well, whose story is this, uh, who is seen to need to know and who in that is given the right to have a say. And I will be looking in particular at donors' family members. So first looking at partners and then looking at donors' own children and then looking at families of origin. So that mean, by that I mean donors' parents, donors' siblings, aunts, uncles, nieces and nephews, and so on. Um, so the first then is about telling partners. And what was really interesting for us as sociologists was that these relationships uh, that donors uh, sort of dealt with the donation in very different ways in these relationships. So when it came to partners, we found that the absolute majority of donors uh, emphasized that they should tell their partner and this has, as you can see on the screen, this has been found, been found in, in previous research as well. Uh, partners would not just seem to be affected or sort of have a stake in the donation, but they were also seen to be involved in the donation process. They were often asked before a donation, uh, sorry, before a donor agreed to donate. They were involved in having a say. Um, Counsellors would often say that they invited partners to be part of the counselling process and some even went as far as saying that they wouldn't allow a donor to go ahead unless their partner was, um, was in agreement that, that the donation was a good idea and they sort of, um, that they as, as partners had, had agreed that the donation was okay and something that was okay to happen. Um, so that, that was really very clear, uh, very sort of a strong finding, a strong theme. When it came to telling children, uh, there was a bit more flexibility in the way that donors sort of approached this and the way in which counsellors also talked about this. 
so the vast majority of our donors and just under half of donors had children of their own in, in the study and these children ranged from uh, preschool to adult children. Some donors became donors when, when their own children were, were already adults. Um, so the vast majority of donors and counsellors thought that children did have a right to know but they were given, there was a lot more flexibility in terms of how donors approached this and when children were told. Uh, about a donation. So as a rule, children were not invited to have a say, but they might be told um, when someone had conceived or even when a, a child had been born. So much, much sort of later down, further down the line. Um, when it came to families of origin, it looked really different, actually. Uh, donors, as well as counsellors, would approach telling families, like uh, donors' parents and siblings and so on, with a lot more flexibility. Typically, parents were told after and siblings were told after the donation took place, if they were told at all, uh, usually after a birth had taken place, um, uh, or plans or donors to spoke to us about their plans for telling in the future, but not being entirely sure how to go about doing that. Uh, so parents and siblings, they were, they were felt to have a stake in the donation, but it didn't necessarily translate into a perception that they should have a say at all. Well, they were not invited to be part of the decision-making process. And part of this was to do with age in the sense that donors might think that, oh, well, by the time a donor-conceived child comes and finds me, my parents will be long dead, so that why should I upset them or why should I sort of even broach the topic? But that wasn't the whole story when it came to families of origin. There was also a sort of perception that it wasn't their place, really, to have a say in what donors did. So looking at then what is going on here, we found these really radically different patterns in terms of who donors thought they should say, who, sorry, who they should tell and when they should tell. And we should suggest that this is very much linked to patterns uh, that sort of work out in relationship where different relational norms follow different moral ideas about what the right thing to do is given a particular relationship, whether that relationship is a couple relationship or whether it's uh, a parent-child relationship or a sibling relationship. Um, so being a partner then is guided by very different ideas when it comes to reproduction. Uh, and we found that that donation sort of weaved its way in, through these relational norms into, into how it was kind of worked through in relationships. And as it did that, we found that two very powerful social ideas about what donation is and what it means come into play in different ways within these relationships. And these two ideas, I've tried to, <laughs> I've tried to make something, um, a bit of a picture about them. So on the one hand, uh, adults, donors, are seen as self-directed, autonomous individuals who make decisions uh, on their own, it's their body, their right to decide what's gonna happen to their body and so on. So that's, that's sort of pulling in one direction, if you like. Uh, but that isn't the whole story because there is also the idea that donors and donors' family are connected by them by virtue of being embedded in each other's lives. Um, and, and we call that reproductive connectedness. And, and so that, that sort of pulls in, in a completely different direction from the idea that donors are completely autonomous and self-directed individuals making their own decisions about, about their lives. Sorry, wrong direction. So what then comes into play here, it seemingly in partner relationships, is that uh, the idea of reproductive connectedness, so the blue arrow, is really uh, sort of um, takes a, a very has a really strong hold in couple relationships. So Polly's account here, so this is a quote. She says, "My boyfriend and I looked through it both together. We didn't apply until I spoke to him about it. So I made sure he was fine with it, and then we went ahead." That was a really really common. A quote within the data set. Um, well, Angela, as I said, uh, many um, sort of infertility counsellors spoke about partners being very strongly encouraged to come along to counselling sessions. So um, the, the, re the sort of the idea of, of partners being connected to the donation and being invited to have a say was really strong. Uh, the idea that donors should just make their own decision was 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 almost completely absent in donor stories when it came to their partners. And when it came to their children, sorry, I keep doing that, uh, that looked really quite different because disclosure, that there was sort of more flexibility when it came to children. And the idea of donors making their own decisions and actually children having some sort of stake in the donation, they were, they were both sort of a little bit on the agenda. So Rita, for example, a, a fertility counsellor said, I say to donors that talking to their own children in their own time when they felt ready, 
could be a positive thing. So you can hear there's quite a lot more sort of flexibility in terms of whether children should be told and when they should be told and so on. Um, and we found that donors such as Jill, Jill's children were uh, teenagers by the time that she started thinking about whether she should tell them that she had acted as a donor as part of her own process of becoming a parent. So she said, I never had a chat to my children, but, but I've now started having that conversation with them. Um, so <clears throat> so when it came to children, there was quite a lot more flexibility. When it came then to families of origin, there was, there was, um, it was almost reversed to, to when it came to partners, because the idea of donors being their own individuals who take their own autonomous decisions was very much in ascendancy here, so the yellow arrow. Uh, whereas the reproductive connectivity was there, and, and donors did think that maybe their parents would be interested or feel themselves to be connected in some way, but that didn't lead them to think that they should have a say at all. So Oliver was really common, <clears throat> was really typical in saying it was 100% my decision. As I said, I told my brother afterwards and my cousins afterwards, Anna again, an identity release donor. I just told my sister, she had brothers, um, but she didn't tell her brothers. Uh, she didn't think anyone needs to know. She didn't tell her mom. Um, no, I thought there was no reason to tell really. I'm quite an independent person. These kinds of accounts were really common. If, if donors told families of origin at all, they would quite often, often tell one person, one sibling, one sister who was close, but not another. Or they might tell a sister, but not their parents and so on. And they might also swear that sister to secrecy, uh, to, so to not tell them. Councillors equally took quite a, a flexible approach to, do, to telling families and would even discourage donors from bringing in their own parents to counselling sessions. So Diane said, you're an adult, can you do this on your own? So, um, so this meant then, sorry, I'm slightly over time now, that uh, whereas we found that the donation very rarely gave rate to, gave rate to tensions, seemingly in couple relationships, it was not uncommon that tension would exist around the donation in relation to with uh, parents and siblings who hadn't been allowed to have a say at all and who would often, like Louise, who I'm just going to talk about very briefly, uh, might not at all be invited to have a say. So Louise was a sister of a donor and she, uh, she, felt, she felt to have a very conflicted position where she did have her own thoughts about the donation but didn't feel like she had a space to voice her own feelings about it. So she said, I have a different opinion around it, okay? Obviously, I think my sister's a grown woman. She can make her own decisions. This is on a sort of superficial level. She's a grown woman, her choice, her body, her life, right? But I find it difficult to dissociate with, you know, they're still her, her biological child. For me, it's quite difficult to process it, but I feel I can't talk about it. So this was something in the family that wasn't um, a subject, really, that the family, that she felt and that, that the family didn't really speak of. And this was not uncommon in, in our interviews with parents and siblings, that this, this sort of theme would come up. So in terms of the questions, whose story is this story about a nation? Um, I think the answer is that that is quite a contentious question and, and actually the people involved have quite diverging opinions about whose story this is. Uh, donors' patterns of disclosure vary radically. Uh, whether people within donors' networks are allowed to make up their own opinions about donation and, and what it means and if they have a stake in it, that also varies quite radically. Uh, so the ideas of donation being other people's stories but also my body, my decision. So this sort of idea of autonomy fluctuates and weaves its way in different ways in different relationships. I hope that makes sense. But it's most stark in donors. So the, the idea of autonomy, my body, my, my decision is most stark in donors' relationship with families of origin. Um, so I think I'll stop there and I'll hand over back to Jennifer, who will, uh, will take your questions now through the chat function. And Leanne, I would be very happy to ask to answer any questions. Thank you both very much. That was that was fantastic. So interesting. Um, OK, so we'll we'll open it up and up for questions now. Just to remind you, please put your questions in the chat uh, function. It, for those of you who haven't used it before, it's at the bottom of the screen. So if you hover over that, you can open the chat and put, and put a question in there. Um, please tell us if you can, um, who you work for or what your interest is in, in donation. Um, okay, so if you 
have a think and put put your questions in the chat and we're going to filter those through um i've actually got one um to start with uh, to sort of kick us off um which is to both of you um petra and leah um it's about um whose story it is and whose gift it is i suppose so um you know, if you can say a bit more about the language of gifts, I think that's really interesting and, and what the gift is and who it's to, and does that change over time? Um, and is there, a, is there a tension in what people say about whether or not you can give, you can actually give a person as a gift or is it a gift of parenthood? Um, so that those kinds of questions, it would be really interesting if you could elaborate a bit on that. Thank you. Um, should I say something? <laughs> um, yeah, I think, well, I think in relation to that last bit of the question saying, is this a gift of a person or is this a gift of parenthood? I think the donors that we spoke to would be pretty adamant that this is a gift of parenthood, that you're, you're giving something that enables people to become parents. And it would be quite problematic for them to think about this as a gift of a, of a child or as a baby. And they, that was something they'd come up against, I think, when they were discussing this with family or with friends I think I can think of one egg in particular whose whose mother saw her who, whose mother felt like she was giving away a baby and she just you know that was actually quite um upsetting for her to, for that for what she was doing to be viewed in that way and she this donor had her own children for, so the gift of parenthood I think was was the key phrase that was used or implied very often um and the fact that it was a gift of parenthood meant there were certain things that the donors had to do to make sure parenthood was fully experienced if that does that if that makes sense it's to make people to ensure people didn't to feel like they were experiencing parenthood fully which meant not in any way feeling like they had to share it with anybody else about well other than a partner perhaps thank that's you that's a that's a lovely question uh, i think also um in terms of who the gift is from, I was really struck by that, that the donation seems to be, and maybe reproduction more broadly, seemed to be very much located in the couple relationship. So it was almost as if it was a gift. So we had one donor who said, I don't know. No, sorry. It was a donor's partner who said, I, I, uh, is it me or is it, 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 uh, is it also from me or is it not? So he was really sort of struggling with that. Yes, it's her thing, but it's not like she's just joined a club she's doing this I've come along to every appointment I'm really involved in this so it was almost I think it does raise questions about who the gift is from mm -hmm. but what I thought was so interesting about patterns of disclosure that I just talked about was about that it didn't really follow genetic connectedness so you might think that the gift is the is the gamete but the gift seemed to be from the couple and the disclosure was was emphasizing the couple who, and obviously the partner had no genetic connection to that egg or sperm that was given away. Whereas the, the families of origin and siblings and so on did have that genetic connection, but they weren't really in the picture. They were not sort of in the picture as much as partners were. Mm. So it was a really interesting, um, you know, who, who is seen to sort of be part of giving that gift was, was uh, perhaps quite counterintuitive in some ways. Okay, thank you. There's lots of questions uh, flooding in now, so I'm, I'm, I'm having to be selective, I'm afraid. Um, but here's one from Emily from the University of Westminster. Were there any instances where the relationship with known donors changed from what it was originally intended? So, for example, a donor became more involved or attached over time than what was, than what was the original plan. Did donor-conceived children lead on how close this relationship was? Again, not sticking to the plan, as it were. <laughs> um, yeah, um, shall I go first, Leah? Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's a really good question. I think these relationships, uh, people sort of often did go into it with a plan, but we also found that they, um, they could change rather, really rather quite a lot. Uh, not just that they sort of changed into one thing, but they, they could change again into something quite different again. Uh, and donors, known donors who had quite a, a big number of recipients, so some of the numbers that we have, so some of the donors that we have in the study are, have quite a big number of recipients. And their relationships with the, with the recipients and their families could really be very varied and, and change over time. 
um, to becoming really close, but it could also go really wrong for a period of time or become very intense. And then it could become less intense. Uh, it could be really joyous and that that could change. So there was a lot of flux uh, within those relationships. Um, I, don't, I don't know, Leah, do you, have you got a sense of whether that flux was led by children? I think mm. maybe sometimes it was, but do you want to I think on that? it's really interesting because that is very much the kind of, especially when you speak to the identity release donors, that's very much the kind of idea about how this should happen. But actually with the known donors, I mean, and this is partly about age. Um, and so a lot of the time with the known donors that we'd interviewed, mostly we're talking about quite young children that had been born from the donation. So it was probably more about the recipient family or the parents leading that. And I, I, I'm thinking about one example in particular where there was a known donor and he uh, I'm losing you Leah slightly he was one of the people that I got this idea oh sorry is that any better yeah. yes okay yeah. um, he talked very much about this whole like I just you know it's their gift I'm, I've always made it clear that I'm very hands off that it's up to them how this goes I can just disappear if you want or I can be around you know it's really up to you and he said it's really interesting because I think because I've been like that, the recipients have relaxed. And actually now I really like it and I'm quite involved and like they might stop by on the way to the shops and the kids sort of call me um, Uncle Harry and it's, you know, you know, I can play with them and they're kind of, he, he used ideas about this being a kind of very extended family type relationship. But that came from his willingness to be led, if you see what I mean. Um, or he's he viewed it that way his willingness to kind of accept whatever label or practice was put on this relationship he saw that as enabling that to be possible so that, if that makes sense um, thank you okay there are there are quite a few questions about how you recruited participants and also um, whether you were able to get any data about donors children or include their perspectives in any way Sorry, there were quite a few people asked that, so I haven't named the people. <laughs> okay. Um, so I guess just briefly about recruitment, I, I didn't talk about that in the slides for timing reasons, I suppose. We took a really varied approach to recruitment because this was a quite a hard to reach group and also because we wanted to incorporate the diversity of routes into donation, as I kind of mentioned before. So we we've recruited through all kinds of methods really we've recruited some donors directly through clinics um, but we've also recruited through um, some of the matching websites and through the Facebook groups and through personal nets we probably have a slightly disproportionate number of donors who have also um, who are also family um, parents through donation as well as having been a donor which has been an interesting sort of subgroup to speak to um so that's kind of the recruitment side of things and then donors children we, I mean, we haven't been able to speak to donors children directly um as part of the study um which i agree is a fascinating a fascinating yeah. topic to explore but we have heard about donors children through their parents um, and their experiences of talking to them or overhearing things that their their children have said. And that's, I think that's been, the, the little bits that we have gained through that have been really interesting. And it's quite, it's quite varied. I think there are some donors who, who quite want to put a, um, a label on this relationship with their, ch with their children and um, uh, usually kind of try and describe in that in those cases maybe kind of discouraging the idea of thinking about this as a sibling and maybe worried about their children thinking about this as a sibling because um it could lead to feelings of kind of loss because they know that as children of donors they don't have any rights to find out about um donor can donor conceived siblings or to contact them or anything like that so it's sort of almost a protective thing to say well, they're not your brothers or sisters. I mean, let's not start thinking about them like that because that could lead to feelings that might be difficult down the, down the line. But I think there were also other donors who really quite like just really intrigued by how their children were going to make sense of this. And it, um, I and in some cases it could be like a sort of safe 
way to explore the relationships between two families to let the kind of to see what the kids did with it in a way um I don't know if that makes sense, but they were you know, quite interested to see what language that the children would put on this, whether they would use words like half brother or half sister or, or not. So it come up with a whole different way of thinking about it. And it could be really interesting and a way that they could explore the relationship between their family and the recipient family in a less threatening way, I suppose, than thinking about the relationship between the donor and the donor conceived person. Mm -hmm. Just to add really briefly to that, that we set out to interview partners and parents. They were sort of our kin group, our, our identified kin. And then as, as we went on, we sort of started to realise how interesting these other, other kin groups would be to talk to. And so we have some sisters who've taken part. And it would be absolutely fascinating to talk to donors' children. Um, particular, I mean, we're going to talk to poli about policy in, in session number two here today, but uh, donors' children are really not sort of on, in, in, on the map at all. Uh, and it's, it would be absolutely fascinating as well as really important, I think, to include donors' children in a, in a study as far as that's possible. Um, I'd like to read another couple of questions that relate to this theme. I don't know how fully you can answer them now or whether it's for later, but I just wanted to read them to you anyway. Uh, one is from o Olivia Montushki, uh, Donor Conception Network, and she says, so genetic relatedness seems to be acknowledged by the donor towards the potential child, but to be, but to be denied with, with relation to their own family. Some donor-conceived adults believe or feel that, that the donor's family are their family. And the other one is from Cassandra Adams, a donor conceived adult. Do you think the hesitation to discuss with family of origin is rooted in the realization that the donor's biological family is also the donor conceived person's biological family? And hence there is more tension in acknowledging that they are keeping the donor conceived child separate, separated from their entire family and vice versa. So. I don't know if you want to comment further on those or. Yeah, thank you for those comments. That's really, really interesting. I think, I think it is, um, as, as sociologists, I suppose, the first thing that I'd like to say in that the studies that I've been part of in terms of donor conception is that genetics isn't one thing for people. It doesn't, people, rather, rather than sort of assuming that it's just something that is there, it's something that people negotiate and see people navigate and give meaning to or deny meaning or in sort of give different kinds of meaning to. So that is, that is sort of part of the picture here, I think. Genetics can both be meaningful and, and not at all meaningful, almost at the same time within, you know, we've heard that within interviews, within minutes of each other, people say, yes, it's really important and, and it doesn't matter at all. So there's a lot of complexity, I think, in, in the way that people attach meaning to to what biology is, what genetics are, what blood is. All of these concepts are really complex in, in the way that they weave their way into everyday lives. Um, but it, it is interesting in the way that donors, uh, you know, this disclosure patterns to families of origin. And I think what is really, what is really interesting there is that actually that we have as a Within, within society. I don't, you know, donors are not making this up, I think, in the way that they disclose to their own families of origin. They very much follow paths of relating that are very sort of uh, very well established social norms. So the way that adults often relate to their own parents as they become adults is through uh, being self directed, autonomous. Indeed, that is part of how we as a society understand what it means to sort of achieve adulthood and, and also be a sort of good adult. So in some ways, you know, these patterns, uh, Jennifer, for example, has been involved in studies about grandparents and these patterns are also really evident in how people, you know, navigate being a grandparent, but not interfering and, and allowing people to be autonomous and self-directed. Uh, so it, this is, you know, it's I, rather than sort of emphasizing genetics, I suppose, I think the norms, that go through here is sort of the, the donors kind of draw on these wider social norms in order to make sense of what is going on in terms of being a donor. Um, I think that is sort of almost stronger than thinking about the genetics for many donors. I don't know if you, Leah, want to add something to that? Yeah, thank you very much. That's a really interesting question. And I, and I think it kind of ties in a little bit with the last one about donors' children, um, because I think, I think, the possibility of 
families of origin thinking about the, their relationship to the donor conceived person in a kind in the in the framework of a kind of genetic kinship idea is part of the reason why some donors don't want to tell especially their parents maybe siblings because they're aware they might see this as like their as their grandchild and I don't think on the I think on the whole the worry about that is the worry that then they they will impose themselves um on the recipient family and that that could be a problem and also it can be a worry because they don't have if if they're not a known donor if this is an identity release situation then it could also feel cause feelings of grief and sadness that they're not able to ever contact this person and we often have saying well actually do you know what my mum's in her 70s now you know it's going to be years and years till someone might possibly possibly contact me um they're not in good health what, what would be the point in telling them because the word you know it can only it, it's only likely to cause distress because they're not going to be able to ever meet them or, and they certainly can't initiate that um so i think i think there was that but i think this is why i think it relates to the last question as well i think there were more concerns and i'm not sure we fully explored this and i think we'd like to explore it more there were more concerns around someone like a a parent a grandparent of um a parent of a donor so someone who might see themselves as a grandparent imposing that kinship label on this relationship to donor conceived people much more so than about children so, so there was less, there wasn't, ten, there didn't tend to be the same concerns about, oh, but my own children are going to really impose this idea that they're brothers or sisters. That didn't seem to be coming up as a potential threat to the recipient family. It could be problematic in other ways for donors, but this idea that they could impose it in a way that would sort of undermine this gift of parenthood, it, it didn't seem to come up in the same way. And I think there's something interesting about generation going on there and what, what can be seen as... Um, as sort of a threat to the the boundaries of the recipient family, perhaps. Can I, can I just um, feed in a, another question there that's come in from Debbie Kennett, uh, who says, we have already seen a number of instances of grandparents taking a consumer DNA test and discovering that they had an unknown donor grandchild. Were the donors and infertility counsellors not aware of this possibility? this is something very much on the horizon now isn't it with with the sort of increasing dna testing and i think we will see more of those and i mean i think it's also important to keep in mind that donors in the in the uk in the 1980s and 90s donated under very different circumstances they were they were anonymous they were they were told that no no contact would ever be made um, you know it's it's important so it's important i think to understand the context in which they donated and and what they were told to think about the donation and how they were they were told by uh, by clinic staff at the time to think about it and so uh, if they haven't told then perhaps that is embedded within the context in which they decided to become a donor as well uh, which has obviously changed massively over the last 10-15 years um, okay yeah thank you i think we can squeeze one more um clutch of questions um, if that's okay in uh, I'm just uh, kind of pulling them together so there's there are there are a couple, at least a couple of questions which are interested in uh, any differences between sperm donors and egg donors in relation to their families of origin and how they talked about that and there's also one which is asking about the, the um, more about the sexuality of the recipients how the more about how the sexuality of the recipients shape donors' interpretations of their roles as donors. Sorry, I know those aren't the same thing. I've, I've, I've put two questions in there. Um, but if you, I think we've got time if you, if, you can, if you can address both of those. Thank you. If I can start with the first one, maybe you, Lee, I can deal with the second one. <laughs> You'd be delighted to. I'm just thinking that's more of a challenging question to think about. Yeah. yeah, I'll do my best. Um, so interestingly, on the issue of do egg donors and sperm donors uh, disclose uh, differently, and we actually found that they were remarkably similar in terms of who they told and when they told. And these patterns that I was saying that, that you know, telling within a couple of relationships is, is really very prominent and much, much less so. That it did, it did span egg donors and, and sperm donors um, 
in similar ways and it also span I think known donors and identity release donors in similar ways so there wasn't a clear gendered patterns in terms of of who donor told uh, which I think is quite interesting in its own right uh, I don't know Julia I want to add anything to that I think it's I think I agree with you in terms of the pattern in terms of the tendency to tell Oh, lost you there for a second. Leah. Oh, you froze again, Lisa, uh, Leah, for a moment. I think, as parents, I think, but I think, am I okay? Or yeah, could you sorry? repeat what you just said? Because I think yes, I'm it. just saying I agree with you in terms of the, the tendency to tell the different groups and and the kind of logic behind that. But I think overall, in our sample, probably. Sperm donors just tended to be less likely to tell people in general, which I think is perhaps generally due to the sort of stigma, the greater stigma attached to being a sperm donor and the more slightly more suspicion maybe or cynicism about their motivations that then they'd feel they'd have to like explain. Egg donors tend to be more free with who they told, they often told people at work and friends, maybe not even that close friends. Um, and one of the reasons we found it difficult to recruit some of sperm donor relatives was because you, you, um, we did it through the donors and so um, often sperm donors will say well I haven't told my parents and I'm single so I can't help you basically um, but I'm just wary of making that to be anything generalizable because actually that very much reflects the the way we recruited our participants as well so we had a lot of sperm donors who'd come through the online groups as well um, often slightly older, um, so I, I, I'd be wary of saying that's that's about gender completely or only. Um, um, and the question about um, sexual orientation, uh, sexual orientation of recipients, right, and how that shaped donors' attitudes. I'm, I think it is a factor, but I'm not actually quite sure how to kind of sum it up at this point. Um, Petra, you might might be able to help but I, I i it definitely was something that that came up and there were um a lot of the donors that we'd spoke to who'd gone through the facebook groups or the online kind of way of finding recipients it's more likely to be donating to lesbian couples or single women and that would often be kind of like celebrated and um I'm just thinking about how it then relates to how they related to the family. And I think people had different ideas then. I think, I think, well, I think the fact that there was no male partner involved, that could sometimes be seen to make things a little bit easier for sperm donors because they would mm. feel that in the few cases where they had donated to a, a known heterosexual couple, then there would often be more um, awareness of, the particular threat around for the for, for, of the donor perceived threat of a donor to the male partner um which is interesting um i don't know petra do you want to add yeah in? no i think that's right i think um the research that i've done with lesbian couples has also sort of shown that they are more mm. um happy with some level of involvement not not necessarily as a co-parent but as a known donor who to some mm. extent is known which um, there, there might be a huge sort of number of heterosexual couples who do have known donors, but if, if so, we haven't heard very much about those couples. Mm -hmm. And the known donors who do, there, there seems to be a lot more tensions essentially around masculinities and sort of uh, hegemonic masculinities mm. when, when sperm donors donate to heterosexual couples uh, in, in those kind of known relationships. So... Um, yeah, it tends to be single women and lesbian couples who, who sort of come mm, up. Mm. Um. And we did have some donors who kind of drew assumptions from uh, the sexuality of who they were donating to about the likelihood of a donor conceived person wanting to get in touch to touch with them as well. So some people would make assumptions that it might be more likely that someone would get in touch if they didn't have a dad in you know in their in their family that they might then start being be more interested in in the donor in that circumstances um which could be perceived in both both ways actually i think interestingly um as as like that might be really great because they might be more likely to get in touch but also maybe some concerns around it as well 
Well, thank you very much, both of you. That's, that's absolutely fascinating. And thanks everybody for their questions, which have been piling in enormously. <laughs>